All right. Uh, starting a new series today on the parables of Jesus. I, as I was uh, sharing with a friend, we were talking about a very gifted musician that we both respect and honor. And, and we were talking about him and come to find out he had a, a, a Christian background. He was raised in a Christian home. As a matter of fact, I believe his father was a pastor and he's uh, you know, in his late, late 30s, early 40s. And he'd come to the conclusion that God was kind of, you know, um, he had a perspective on God that was different than what we think someone who'd be raised in a Christian home would be like. And he said, you know, I, I can hang with Jesus, but the church is a really, I, I don't get the church at all. And I thought, man, Lord, that is so sad because we, we represent, supposedly the church represents Jesus. Supposedly a Christian is supposed to be Christ-like. Supposedly our message should be something that Jesus kind of talked about. And obviously there's a distinct difference between what he's experienced in God and what Jesus actually said. And so I decided to do the parables of Jesus, change your mind and change your world. Uh, Jesus spoke in parables and he spoke in parables because there were people that were hungry for God. And if you're listening, and that's why it's amazing that Jesus would end every parable and every teaching with, for those that have ears to hear, which implies I'm speaking truth. So it's not a lack of truth. Are you listening? Will you hear? Will you get beyond the restraint of, of your religious background, of your religious experience, and actually hear? And there's a strong possibility that Jesus, the most amazing teacher ever known to man, the people that were listening to him weren't hearing him. And, and I, I really think that we're, we're at a very interesting place in our church, and I believe this is prophetically a, a great teaching, and I think it's, it's going to set some things in order for all of us. You know, Jesus was dealing with the very same thing in Matthew uh, 23, He's, he says that uh, Jesus said to the crowd and the disciples, so Jesus is preaching. And then he says, hey, guys, all you crowds, come over here with me. And disciples come over here. And in, in the group that he's preaching to are the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they'd always followed him around trying to figure out a way to, to trick him or try to figure out if he said something wrong. And he says to them, he get, come over here. Let me show you something. Verse 2 says, he says, he says in verse 2, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. He says, they got the word. See those guys over there? They're the official interpreters of the law of Moses. Next verse, please. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example for they don't practice what they teach. <laughs> this should not be true among believers. But obviously a four wall religious experience has not translated really well to the body or to, the, to normal people, just regular people. Because they have a perception of what Christianity is like based on what they've heard within church doctrine or background or experiences. And how many know a religious experience doesn't necessarily involve God at all? A lot of things are said in God's name that God's going, I didn't say that. <laughs> so he says here, so verse four says that uh, they crush people with impossible religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. This is what Jesus is dealing with. The very same thing we're dealing with. Well, I can follow Jesus, but this, this religious thing, I don't know, this church stuff, I don't get. Then verse 5 says, they, they, everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scriptures, verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. Now, the, the robes were the, ta the, that was the prayer shawl. And if you're really, really spiritual, you had longer tassels. <laughs> so, man, you got your prayer shawl, it's dragging in the, in the ground. Hey, you bet I pray. Look, see, see all that tassels dragging in the ground? That's me, baby. It's all for show. Or, or they carry, there's supposed to be a certain size on your arm for your scripture. It doesn't take much, but they got this box they're walking around in. Hey, I'm very spiritual. Everything is for show. Everything's about them. And that's why it doesn't feel right. That's why it doesn't translate for somebody that's hungry, for someone who's hungry for God and they hear this message that's all about them. You want to go, is that it? And the world has seen more of that. And all you got to do is watch Christian TV and you just wonder, why are you on TV? Yes. It becomes something different than what it's meant to be. And so I thought, man, we, we need to address this. And so the idea of this idea that this brother had of, I can kind of get to Jesus, but I don't get the church. I think it's time that we make it the same. Yes. And we make it the same by what we do in this room and how we live out there. Encouraging one another in the things of God and let it let it be seen in the world. That's what it's all about. So connecting to Jesus, connecting to the Jesus we can hang with and the church we can live with. That's what we're going to cover for the next several weeks. And we're going to go, go to the parables. And so I decided to go through all the parables that are said more than once. 
And, and I found a few that are said three times. So when, when God, by the Holy Spirit, shows you a parable through, you know, Jesus' teaching and someone wrote it down by the Spirit, and they, they say it once, you want to go, that's pretty good. If they say it twice, you go, maybe we should. But if he said it three times, then maybe we really need to look at this thing. So I'm covering the parables, and I came across chronologically the first one. And it's not, not coincidental, the first one happens to be the one about putting new cloth on old cloth and putting new wine in old wineskins. And I don't think it's coincidental. Jesus is saying, I'm about to tell you some truth. I'm about to re reveal the heartbeat of Father. And it's going to be new. And you can't take this new thing and put it on old concepts. And each one of us in this room have concepts and, and, and certain thoughts about how God works and how he doesn't work. And, and I believe prophetically God is saying it's time to put all that on the table. That it's possible that you're, you, you, you've made some decisions based on injury and pain and fear rather than the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is possible. I, I recently went through something very similar, and I'll be sharing this a little later in the, in the month, dealing with the, the building, that I just realized that I was, I was sensing and, and deciding, making decisions based on fear and based on something other than the leading of the Holy Spirit. I have to go, Lord, wow, I, I got to stop and just get closer to you. And I believe this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. I, you know, this particular uh, story about new cloth on old coat and new wine, old wine skin, you find it in Matthew 9, 16 and Mark 2, 21 and Luke 5, 36. And uh, Mark 5, 21 says basically, besides who would patch old clothing with new cloth? And he explains it for the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins for the wine would burst the wineskin and the wine and the skin would both be lost. New wine called for new wineskin. And I, again, Jesus is saying this bef as one of the first parables of, of this 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 encounter with people after, you know, starting his ministry. And this is the first parable that he, he basically gives. And he's saying, I'm going to live for three more years and tell you a lot of stuff. And if you don't hear it and put it in something new, the chances of destroying both is a possibility. And I love, uh, I was thinking, well, how does that apply to us? Well, I was thinking about Romans 5 at the end where Paul says, wherever sin abounds, grades us much more abound. And then verse chapter 6 starts off, verse 1 starts off as if I'm going, Paul had to deal with the very same thing of someone saying, of someone possibly hearing a truth and then interpreting it by the flesh. So, so someone in, in, in the congregation that Paul was writing to possibly could have heard, if sin abounds, grace is much more abound. There may be someone going, well, heck, if that's the truth, let's go sin. I just want to help God out. You know, let him really pour his grace on. And then chapter 6 says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? He says, what are you, crazy? No. It is possible that you hear a revelation of God in any capacity, which financial or spiritual, you know, or, or grace or power. And you take this thing and you, come, you, you fit it into something natural. And this is what this individual or Paul was addressing, an individual that would hear about the grace of God and interpret it through fleshly ears and say, well, if that's grace, then I can go ahead and sin more and more. And that's why he wrote the next chapter, the verse that says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? No, because he knew somebody was going to get it weird, interpreted weirdly. And it is possible that we, in our pain and our hurt, hear a truth from God and establish that truth in our flesh, not really realizing that our flesh is dead. It's like when someone back in the prosperity movement way back in the day where someone said, hey, if you give a hundred bucks, you got to make a thousand. Well, praise God. Let me write that check. And then when it didn't happen, he said, well, here, God doesn't work because well, God won't meet you in selfishness. He won't meet you in just principle. It's relationship. And you can write the thousand dollars and go, I didn't get my 10th. I should have gotten 10,000 because I'm out. I'm out now because you didn't perform, God. Because you were doing something in the flesh out of greed. And it sounded good. So this is the idea of new wine in new wineskin. The idea of making sure that, that you're not hearing some truth based on a, a weird fleshly all about you. And realize that you have died to this thing. And that's what he's addressing here.
In the statement, in the story that Jesus used, I find it I, it's the coolest thing in the world that he's talking about cloths and he's talking about wine and, and wineskin stuff that people would be aware of. And something you have to understand, God, our great father, is going to speak to you every day, every moment, every second, if you're listening. And he'll talk to you in a way that will make sense to you. What, what, what an, uh, and you've heard me say it before, what a terrible father it would be that he would have revelation and you speak English and he spoke Spanish. And he would say, I'm going to speak Spanish just to frustrate them. Wouldn't that be the coolest thing? No, God would never want you to live a frustrated life not knowing his will. But he's always talking. He's always teaching. It's all around you. Are you listening? In Proverbs 25, it says that, that, that heaven is all, I'm sorry, I already got that. Heaven is always teaching. Oh, did I not, not say this? Heaven is always teaching and revealing truth and guidance to us in a language we will understand. It's up to us to discern, see, listen, and activate. Why is it up to us? Because you're kings. You're not slaves. You're kings. You're royalty. You belong to him. You're heirs. It is God's privilege to conceal things and the king's privilege to discover them. When you realize that who you are, you are meant to be uh, kings and, and priests in the things of God. You are meant to hear from him. And if you consider yourself a slave, then you're thinking, well, he's going to hold something out for me again. I have to work for it. You, 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 you can't approach father as a slave. You're a king. And because you're a king, you are designed to discern a thing. You have, you have the right and the ability to get before the father as a king because you are, because he's in you to see things nobody else can see. And as you read his word, it'll come alive. As you see something that everyone passes every day, it'll speak to you differently because you're a king. Don't forfeit being a king just because you're experiencing some form of slavery. That's not who you are. But don't be surprised that the enemy is going to constantly try to get you to think like a slave. That's not who you are. And the revelations of God are all around you. And he's speaking in a language you will understand because you're a king and you have the right to discern. You got to know who you are. So parables, change your mind, change your world. Let's talk about that new cloth real quick. Okay, okay. so in the story, he, 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 he explains that when you put something new, a new cloth on an old cloth, the new cloth is going to shrink because that's what cloth, I guess that's what clothes do. You know, I've done that a couple of times. That's why Kim won't let me do, used to do the laundry. She won't because, and, and I, I put stuff in there and all of a sudden this thing that was supposed to, you know, fit, I was like, that's why she's, don't touch the laundry. Yes, ma'am. So here's the idea. The idea of placing this patch on an old piece of fabric with new fabric, it's not good. The, the consequences, because everybody knows it's going to tear away. And the idea is that both will be damaged. When you approach with God and you hear a great revelation and you use a fleshly motivation and then you wonder why it doesn't work, the possibility of you being injured and saying, that's it, I don't trust God anymore, is a possibility. Because you put something pure and honest and from heaven on something that's fleshly and you wonder why it didn't work. Because you're in the flesh. You know what I'm saying? And that's why we have a lot of injured people because they, they tried to do something spiritual, but their motivation was about them. And God is about the heart, right? God is about the motivation of the heart. What's the motive of the heart? Not so much the action, because the action comes from the motivation of the heart. If I get the heart fixed, then the, the rest of it will change. It will be taken care of. What's going on in the heart? You know, I love when Paul, when David said in, in Psalm 51, unto you and you alone have I sinned. I'm going... Really? In essence, he's saying, out of all the activities of stupidity that I did, unto you and you alone, I, I stopped trusting you. And every, every action came from this seed of not trusting you. And really, every sin that we commit, it usually, it, well, it is. The seed is, I don't trust that you're enough, God, so I'm going to step out and do my own thing. That's flesh. Instead of waiting on the Lord, trusting him. So the idea of this idea of the cloth and new wine as well, the idea of uh, wine is going to ferment. So you get new wine, you put it into a, a new wineskin, and the fermentation process stretches that, that wineskin, and then it comes to a certain place and stops, and everything is cool. 
So you get that, you empty out that you, that old wine skin and you put new wine in it, it's going to wind up, because of the fermentation process, it's going to wind up stretching in more, and then you're going to lose the new wine and the, the wine skin. So when you hear something wonderful, the things of God, and try to patch it into something that's self, about self, the possibility of losing both is real high. That's why you have to understand that you've died. Amen. You've died to self, and you're alive in Christ. And you live for him and everything's about him being glorified. <laughs> and this is another thing. I, and I have to go back to this. You have to know who you are. You're an heir, not a slave. And if you grasp being an heir, then everything changes. I wrote this down. Heirs think differently than slaves. That's why Jesus is teaching something that will be completely different from the religious order of the day. The answer that you're looking for will not be found in the status quo. Right now, God, I believe, supernaturally is doing something here at the bridge and supernaturally, spiritually, today, doing something something differently in you. And if you hold on to the status quo, no matter what those may be, those moorings that you've established, all that you've come to a certain way, this is the way God works, this is the way it works. And I think God is saying, I'm fixing to do something brand new. There's about, there's about new wine coming. And Will you put the old thing away and say, God, I got new wineskin for you. Here I am. That whatever you say, we will do. And it really is coming down to that. And I think you have to work through the process of what is flesh, what is fear, and what is faith. And we're moving to a place. And I think it's important. Prophetically speaking, this is what I think is going on. Everything that you have settled to be your norm is about to be challenged. Will you change your mind and be baptized in God's new direction? In every area, in worship and service and love and relationship, finances, all of mind, body, and soul, it's all up for grabs. I believe God prophetically saying it's all up for grabs. So let me show you what I mean by that. In worship, if God performs, then I'll praise him. The truth of the matter, he's worthy of praise no matter what happens. See, we, we think we come to church to get a blessing. I, I'm coming in. Here's my, I, I, I clocked in, God. Beep, I'm here. So you owe me. See, if you perform, God, if you'll do X, Y, and Z, then I'll praise you. But if you don't, then I'm out. That's about you. It sounds kind of okay, but it's really how pagans operate. So you're approaching God with a paganistic approach. I've done my stuff. I've checked all the boxes. Now it's up to you, God. To He's God. We don't come to church to get a blessing. We come to church to bless God, and we're blessed. We seek him first and all these things will be added. And it's not a gimmick. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and seek you first for the next three days. And if you don't perform, no, we live seeking him first. We live surrendered. There's no, there's no. And I, you know what's funny about that though? God will meet you sometimes even in your goofiness because he's a loving father. But truly, he is God and worthy of praise no matter what happens. That's how worship is supposed to be. Or about love. I only love those who love me. Yet Jesus said we're to love our enemies. If you love me, then I love you. Well, that, that's not the very, the very definition of love is to love someone without expecting anything back. The very definition of love is giving it away. That, that's the very essence of of God kind of love. And, and then we're told that Jesus said said to love your enemies. How's that possible? Because you, you, you see them differently. As a king, you see things differently. Anyone who's hurt is, is out to hurt somebody else. And, and the people that have hurt, hurt you in your life were hurt people themselves. And they were dealing with their junk as well. And, and it came across this way. And you got to be able to go, Lord, that doesn't affect me because I forgive and let that go. And you deal with that individual. I just cast a hole of my care upon you. And I choose to love because I can't handle judgment. I can't handle hate. I, I choose to love and let them go. And I choose to find out something honorable to say about that oppressor of my life to release myself from all the junk. If you had a terrible, terrible situation growing up and, and you had an oppressor for a father or a mother, you got to find some way of... of 
of honor to diffuse all the junk that could be part of your life. And if all you come up with is, you know, he, he wore a good blue suit. That's all I can say. <laughs> but you, you stay in the area of honor because that diffuses the effects on your life because you're honoring the Lord as you honor your father and your mother. And it'll be long days for you. It'll be good for you. But if you only love those that love you, what, what is that? Jesus even talked about that. Who, and even the heathens do that. No, th this is a, a stretch. In service, well, on the head, not the tail. Jesus gave up all to serve God and man. He said that he emptied himself. But I have the right not, you know, I don't have to serve because I'm the head. And I, well, Jesus, our example, emptied himself and served God and man. We lay down our, no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend. This is a whole new world, y'all. And I think we've been trained, and rightly so, in some degree. You know, we, we, we had a weird mindset back in the day and, and finding out who we are in Christ and the authority that we walk, it's all good. But authority that you walk in is out of complete surrender. It's not authority that I choose to grab onto, it's out of complete surrender. And when you completely surrender your life to God and die, you come alive with all the authority that you walk in, not grasp for, you walk in. It's a different, different mindset. I don't hold on to my authority. I don't try to find, I walk in it. That's who we are. In relationships, I love those who are like me. Yeah, that's a scary thought. God says, love the, the, the unlovable. Because once again, you, you're not just filled to the rim with love. You're filled to overwhelming, overflowing. As a matter of fact, you are actually a river of overflowing, ever perpetuating love. It's always flowing. And you have the ability to key in on that. You have the ability to walk in that. In finances, I have the right to enjoy my money. In this covenant, he owns it all. Now, some people uh, have a great teaching on 10%. I think that's wonderful. And some people, uh, because of some of the manipulations in church life that has been done on TV as well as in church life, there's been some people that have abused that whole 10% thing. And so some folks say, hey, forget it, man. That's old covenant. Well, what if, what if you got all your answers together? Let me tell you why I don't have to pay 10%. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to investigate. I'm gonna... And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to pay 10%. Get behind me, Satan. Really? See, here's the thing. Every area of your life is subject to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it is confirmed by His Word. And so when, when you come up with an argument not to be a blessing, you're kind of treading on weird ground there. Because <laughs> in this covenant, if 10% if was the old covenant, which is, well, let's say it is, the Bible says this covenant is far greater than the old covenant. Far greater is that he owns it all. And in this covenant, you're a conduit of being, of being a blessing to people everywhere you go. 10% is great, and it really is for, uh, you know, budgeting, and that's all fine and good. You know, Kim and I, like I said, our conviction before, before God with each other when we first got married was that we will, we will pay 10%. We're going to just write that off because... That's what we believe that would honor the Lord. That's what we decided. We, that's what we decided to do in faith. That wasn't all we do. We, 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 we pray about other things that God would put in our hearts to give because in this covenant, he owns it all, church. And you're a conduit. And if you spent more time developing an argument on why not to give, that kind of puts you in a weird place because God is a giver. So these things, I'm talking about moorings in our life that maybe have been established out of pain more than by the Holy Spirit that we have to address in life. I rule and reign and command a blessing, okay? I surrender and live in blessing. Okay, one's about you doing something, one's about resting in what's been done. But see, these are things that we're talking about that I believe the Holy Spirit is leading us to something deeper. But you have to understand, it is possible through history, experience, pain, that you've developed certain thought processes that protect you, and you've got Scripture all there for them, and maybe the Holy Spirit is saying, 
it's time to to address these issues. So I, I think um, we're all going through a journey for the next several weeks. You know, it says when, when, when John died that, that Jesus continued in the same message. And next week I'll be sharing with you uh, John's message because if Jesus continues with that message, it's important to find out what that message was. But just in a nutshell, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It says this in, uh, in uh, Matthew 4, 17, for that, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this word repent means to think differently, to reconsider. So everything we're talking about right now by the Holy Spirit, old wine, I mean, a new wine and, new, and old wineskins, new cloth and old, all the stuff we're talking about is will you rethink, will you reconsider? Will you open your heart to say, okay, God, there's been some moorings that I've established in my life based on what I thought was a, a solid, you know, co- you know, defense or, or offense in, my, in, my, in the word. I, I'm going to lay it all down. And I, whatever you say, I will do. That's new wineskin. That's new cloth. And I'm, I'm, I, I believe the Holy Spirit is asking us to change our mind. Will you stop? Will you reconsider? Will you rethink? Let me tell you how new cloth and new wine works. New cloth and new wine cost you everything. Cost you everything. But this is the amazing thing. When you surrender everything to God, God surrenders all of heaven to you. Take the exchange. (laughs) I encourage you, you get a better deal on this side. All heaven, the Holy Spirit guiding you in a surrendered life not just on Sunday morning, every day is far greater, far better, better promises. And it comes from this. It costs me everything. I have died. New cloth must be purchased to make new clothes, and something has to die to provide new wineskin. I think the Holy Spirit's asking us to go on a journey with Him in our lives by the Spirit. So I, I leave you with that. Uh, Try it for a week. Try this for a week. Try it for a week. It's what we say around here. I, I get confused and try saying, I say, try it. Try this for a week. But Kim told me, it's try it for a week, Orlando. You said it. Try it for a week. <laughs> so Tifa, this is, what, this is what Tifa means. This week, I open my heart to hear from my father in every part of my life. His spirit will guide. His word will direct And I'll act on what he says. As he is, so will I be, a child of God without reservation. Let's try this for a week. Open up your heart. I believe God is pouring something brand new in all of us. And it's only by the Spirit. And and you need to just... Whatever you say, God. And this means everything's up for grabs. I mean, everything. You know what I'm saying? I mean, even like that, you know, like, like, like that quart of ice cream you go through before you go to bed. <laughs> oh, now you're messing with me, Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to say, is that not a good thing, God? <laughs> it, it's going to be closer to you than you realize. It's, it, 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 it's going to be stuff you... You're going to see God in the most simplistic ways because that's how he talks to us. So open up your heart and be ready to see something phenomenal. And he'll guide you and direct you. And it'll be from glory to glory to glory. Let's pray. Now, Father, we open up our heart. We thank you for this word today, God. It's by your spirit. You're guiding us. You're leading us. And every parable within each teaching was the potential for people not hearing. I'm praying right now that all of us are hearing from the heart. I pray that your revelation, God, comes to us and we don't mix it with something from pain or flesh, but we hear it in our resurrected life in you. And I thank you for the return will be great because what you do, God, it's who you are. But we, we, we open our heart to you, God, in every area. 
every area of our life. Have your way. We surrender and, and to be what you are on this earth is what you've asked us to be, examples of, of life and joy. I pray all of us will uh, take it to heart. This is your day, God. This is your temple. This is, this is your life. Live through us. Help us to hear every whisper. Help us to know every gaze of your presence. We love you and we thank you. Now, there may be somebody here who never received Jesus. I want you to repeat the prayer of receiving Jesus as Lord of our lives. Father, and I call you my Father, thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. My sins are forgiven. My past is forgotten. I have strength for today and great hope for tomorrow. I belong to you and you belong to me. You're my father and I'm your child. Amen.